In looking at naval history, you often see ships that don't have long lives. Ships that see one battle and sink in that battle, or soon after. Ships that last maybe a year, sometimes less, before slipping beneath the waves. While these are often known better than ships with long, boring lives, sometimes this isn't the case. Sometimes these short-lived ships fade from history. They are forgotten for doing nothing of note before sinking. USS S-5 is a perfect example of that. While multiple American submarines had issues with sinking in this time period, S-5 is less likely to come up in discussion compared to, say, S-48. Though the circumstances of their sinkings are remarkably similar. For S-5, well, normally I would talk about the history in some detail. As this is a case where the history amounts to a handful of months between her construction and her sinking, there's not much to talk about. Her sinking will be covered in some detail, though. I will forewarn everyone. This is going to be the kind of video where there aren't very many pictures, because there aren't very many pictures to be had. That aside, her story begins as one of many, many S-Class submarines. S-boats, pig boats, sugar boats, whatever name you want to give them, these were a large grouping of submarines built for the USN between the end of World War I and the middle of the 1920s. The largest class of American submarine, in both ship size and number of boats built to that point, these were a common sight in the interwar period. Though they were, in realistic terms, less a class and more a type. The different groups of subs were often quite different from each other. In general terms, though, these were small and cramped submarines in comparison to later designs. Even so, as the first properly ocean-going submarines of the USN, they were valuable for training and for learning how to operate submarines at long distances. Valuable practice for the future even as a large portion of them remained in service into and through World War II. S-5 was not one of those lucky ones. She was laid down in the Portsmouth Navy Yard on December 4th, 1917. Her launching on November 10th, 1919 might seem remarkably slow for a submarine in that day and age, but the days of the Second World War, where a submarine could be laid down and launched within a year, were a ways away. In any event, when she entered the water, S-5 was a fairly typical submarine for the time. She displaced 890 tons on the surface, and 1,110 tons submerged. Her equipment on that displacement was also fairly typical, consisting of a single 4-inch deck gun and four 21-inch torpedo tubes, with a capacity of 12 torpedoes. All of these tubes were mounted in the bow, leaving her with nothing for the stern. As for her propulsion, with her diesel engines outputting 1,000 horsepower and her electric motors 600 horsepower, S5 was theoretically capable of 15 knots on the surface and 11 knots submerged. I say theoretically for a reason that will become apparent soon enough. S5 was formally commissioned into the United States Navy on March 6, 1920, under the command of one Lieutenant Commander Charles Cook. This was a formality, however, because she still required her sea trials before properly entering service. At first, these went well enough. Her builder's trial, outfitting, and crew training went off without a hitch. However, on August 30th, 1920, S-5 set out on her full power trials. These were intended to test her propulsion systems, and were, in a lot of ways, the wrapping up phase of her sea trials. The Navy even planned for S-5 to go on a four-city recruiting tour upon completion of the trials, followed up with a visit to sunny Bermuda. This showy performance would surely drive up recruitment by showing off the brand new, shiny submarine, right? Up to this point, everything is routine and expected. It is here where things start to go decidedly wrong. A problem had been identified on the submarine during her earlier trials. Her main induction valve, which brought fresh air into the boat on the surface, was surprisingly difficult to close. This was a necessary piece of equipment, not just for the crew not suffocating, but for keeping the diesel engines running. They required a steady supply of fresh air, just as the crew did. That being said, the valve had to be closed when the submarine dived, or else flooding would quickly follow. I think you can see where this is going by now. 
On the morning of September 1st, Cook ordered his submarine to conduct a crash dive drill. This was to test how fast the submarine could submerge, and up to this point, S-5 had only managed about four minutes to dive. The Navy standard was under one minute. Unfortunately, things went awry fairly quickly. As S-5 dived, issues with a different set of valves kept her chief of the boat distracted. As the induction valve couldn't be closed until the engines came to a complete stop, this was a fatal distraction. By the time that man, Percy Fox, realized his mistake and slammed the lever to close the valve, it jammed open. Water poured into S-5, quickly rising in her torpedo room and even the command room. To her crew's credit, they were prompt at trying to solve the issue. They closed most of the open vents, but even with multiple men tugging at it, the induction valve refused to shut completely. With the torpedo room completely flooded, albeit sealed off with a watertight door, S-5 plummeted to the bottom. Cook attempted to blow the ballast tanks to surface, but the weight of the water in the bow dragged the boat down anyway. As she dove at an angle, S-5 actually impacted the bottom, 180 feet down, twice. First when her bow struck, then again when the stern settled. Luckily, the submarine didn't crack welds or split open. Unluckily, they were still stuck on the bottom, with the torpedo room flooded and abandoned, and with the induction valve still open. The pumps weren't up to emptying the submarine, and their main power was out after water wrecked the control panel. Not exactly a good situation to be in. Not the worst, though, as four or five compartments were dry, and the submarine was upright and largely undamaged. Main power was out, yes, but they still had some emergency lighting to work with. Still, in spite of Cook working through every option he could think of, the sub wasn't getting off the bottom. It was, at this point, several hours after the initial sinking, that Cook had a moment of desperate ingenuity. Desperate genius, even. He blew the submarine's aft ballast tanks, expelling every bit of air in them. Perhaps he hoped that would raise the bow, in spite of the water inside it. Perhaps he had an inkling of what it would actually do. Regardless, the result was good, but probably not fun for the crew. The aft of the submarine, still buoyant and filled with air, shot towards the surface. The bow remained firmly stuck in the mud, though, with the result that men, equipment, and generally anything not nailed down fell towards the bow. S-5 ended up at an angle of about 60 degrees, with her stern sticking out of the water. The immediate effect of this, beyond the obvious, was that water from the bilges flowed into the battery room. This was less than ideal, as water plus batteries equaled chlorine gas. You know, the same kind being lobbed across no man's land on the trenches of the Great War. After pulling everyone through the hatches, one man nearly drowning in the battery room, another watertight door was slammed shut. S-5 was now down two compartments and canted at an angle with only part of her stern visible. On the one hand, the crew were lucky that their submarine was 231 feet long, allowing for some to poke out of the water. On the other hand, they were unlucky in that S-5 lacked a stern torpedo tube to crawl out of, as men would later do through bow tubes on her sister, S-48. In any case, tilted at a wild angle or not, the men can now set about thinking of a way out of the submarine. In spite of the terrible air quality and general discomfort, the men managed to work out that, at their angle, about 14 feet of the sub should be above water. Through tapping about in the motor room, they confirmed that, in addition to the sound of water flowing across the stern. Which means that the men were now high and dry, if not exactly comfortable, in the dark confines of their submarine soaked to the bone and covered in various things you probably don't want to think about. Unfortunately, the aft escape hatch was still 30 feet below the surface. With no actual exit to hand, the men began applying the kind of ingenuity you expect out of some mariners across history. If they don't have a hole to crawl out of, they just make one. Well, first Cook had a few men squeezed to the very aftmost part of S5, the tiller room, to use a hand-powered drill. They managed to get through the tough steel of the submarine, three-quarters of an inch thick, and confirmed through light and fresh air that they were on the surface. It took 20 minutes to drill that one single hole. To create something big enough to climb out of, they would need more than 100 holes, 
on top of hammering and chiseling between the holes. It was calculated as taking about 30 hours to do that, with non-stop work. While they probably didn't have the air for that, the men set about doing it anyway, because they weren't just going to sit around and wait to die. Even so, and in spite of finding and burning out an electric drill, the situation seemed increasingly hopeless. With five hours of non-stop drilling, they had opened a four inch by one inch slot in the hull. After expanding that a bit more through the night, they made a hole big enough to see outside. Cook looked through and saw a ship passing by. A ship that continued passing by without stopping. Another one would pass by an hour later, also without stopping. That being said, the men continued to work anyway, in spite of the air sapping their energy and growing more difficult to breathe by the minute. And if the hole they were cutting submerged and let more water in, well. The men kept working. After 16 hours, they had created a 6 inch by 8 inch hole. At this point, many of the crew were passed out from the terrible air quality. Cook, continuing to work, spotted a third ship. A 10 foot copper pipe was passed to the captain, along with a clean white shirt someone dug up from a duffel bag. This was stuck through the hole and waved frantically back and forth. At first it seemed like the ship had missed S5 once again, and their last hope had failed. It actually had not. Aboard the freighter, Atlantis, one of her crew saw an unusual object sticking above the waves and a crazily waving flag. The freighter's captain, Ernst Johnson, turned his ship around and sent a small boat over to take a look. The conversation between the two captains is a humorous one, especially considering the dire situation S5 was in. What ship? Johnson asked first. S5, Cook answered. What nationality? From Johnson. American? From Cook. Where bound? From a probably bemused Johnson. Hell by compass? From the devil may care Cook. In spite of this exchange, Johnson did realize just how bad the situation was. He nosed his freighter up against S5 stern, without even scratching the paint, and secured her to the submarine. A wooden platform was jury-rigged between the ships, allowing his crew to help cut at the hole. Once large enough, the freighter's crew passed through two hoses into S5, one for fresh water and the other for fresh air. Something I'm sure the crew appreciated, as it was now September 2nd by this point. Further cables were rigged beneath S5's stern to keep her on the surface, though the little freighter lacked any way to pull her out of the water. Nor did she have a way to call for help, as her wireless operator had been left ashore. The rescue was still a difficult thing at this point, even with the help of the freighter. Luckily for S5's beleaguered crew, Atlantis was able to wave down another ship with signal flags that evening. That ship did have the ability to call for help. After tying his ship up to S5 and joining in the cutting process, the Navy was alerted to S5's predicament by the captain of the second ship. As it would turn out, the Navy wasn't required to evacuate the crew. Between S5's rejuvenated men and the chief engineer of the second ship, William Grace, they were able to cut away into the hull. Grace, apparently a massive man, slammed a sledgehammer against a two-foot section of hull that had been drilled and chiseled all night. This was at midnight on September 3rd. Grace's blow dislodged the plate, which S5's crewmen lowered out of the way. By 1.30 a.m., the first member of S5's crew climbed out. By 2.45, Cook, the last to leave, exited his submarine. The ordeal had lasted more than 36 hours, all told. While the crew was brought home, the battleship USS Ohio attempted to tow S5 to shallower water. This was to make it easier to salvage her. Ohio only managed about 3 miles and 30 minutes of towing after breaking the sub from the bottom before the tow line snapped and S5 fell down for a third and final time, ending up 160 feet below the waves. After this, salvage efforts would continue for some time. The Navy was hardly going to want to abandon what was, damage aside, a brand new submarine. But after 477 dives and multiple failed attempts to seal leaks, S5 was declared lost on September 3rd, 1921. Exactly one year to the day after the rescue of her tenacious and heroic crew. Thank you for watching. Remember to like, comment, and subscribe if you enjoy the content, and I'll see you in the next one.